Good afternoon, and, good afternoon, and welcome to the Robert and Helen Seiler Distinguished Lecture Series. This lecture is the keynote event of the 70th anniversary of the Department of City and Regional Planning at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. My name is Danielle Spurlock, and I'm one of the new additions to the faculty. I'm also a triple Tar Heel, so I bleed Carolina blue. <laughs> Uh, both of my masters were from here. Uh, I did a joint degree program with City Regional Planning and the Department of Health Behavior in the School of Public Health. I'd like to thank Dr. Emil Melizia for bringing me to planning. <laughs> and I'd like to thank Dr. Philip Burke. Uh, when I did my PhD here in land use and environmental planning, he, one, put up with me, but helped me get through my second bout of graduate school. So thank you to you both. And this first part is about a lot of thank yous. Thank yous to all the people in this room that enabled me to have my dream job. <laughs> first, to the alumni. We have alumni here representing every, almost every decade of the uh, department's history, with the exception of the 1940s. I want to take this moment to, for a special salute to the class of 1966. Can you wave your hands? <laughs> yes. Yes, this is their 50th anniversary. Yes, our alums have shaped city skylines, tirelessly advocated for affordable housing, created economic development initiatives at the local, state, and federal level, and modified how we travel by creating and critiquing public transit systems and airports. They are elected officials, they are the heads of nonprofit organizations, they are planners. In short, they have altered uh, all the places where we live, work, and play. You and your professional contributions have made DCRP one of the best planning programs in the country. Thank you. So. <laughs> all right. To the current students in the room, thank you for your energy and dedication that you bring to New East. Uh, your desire to learn is infectious and incredibly necessary at certain points in the semester. Um, I hope you'll use this event as a crystal ball as you decide where you want to contribute your time and talent. You are the future of DCRP. To the faculty and staff that made this event possible. So many people had a hand in this, so I can't name them all. But a special recognition first to our chair, Dr. Roberto Garcia. And to, yes. and to Udo, who has done so much in making sure the pictures and the technology works. And also, if we can have a special round of applause for Annie Bauman Mitchell, Shannon Brownfield, and Dr. Nicola Lowe, who, along with the Arts and Science Foundation and the General Alumni Association, tackled the major logistic quag quagmire that is to pull off an event like this in the middle of the semester. Thank you for all your efforts and dedication. <laughs> all right. I would also like to recognize a former faculty member who could not be here with us today, Professor Stu Chapin. As a land use planner, I knew Professor Chapin was a giant in the field, and I used land use, uh, urban land use planning in my teaching and research. I was also a recipient of the Chapin Fund when I did my doctoral studies, which allowed me to collect data at an unprecedented level. The cherry on the top of all this is about two years ago, I sent Professor Chapin a letter describing my research. And he wrote back. <laughs> um, I was smiling from ear to ear that day. It was like walking on sunshine. Um, uh, we've exchanged a few letters since then, and he has challenged me to focus on how planning must participate in the mitigation and adaptation actions necessary to address climate change. I only hope to be half as engaged as he is in his 100th year. Lastly, <laughs> to, but most, in, most importantly, to Robert and Helen Seiler, if you will wave. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
you established this distinguished lecture series in 1994 with the first event occurring 20 years ago. Each speaker aims to draw together the academic planning field with professionals in the field. Your bridging efforts have made us a stronger discipline. Jo please join me in thanking the Silers for their commitment to planning and to DCRP. So you're getting to the last time that I'm going to ask you to clap, at least for right now. <laughs> it is in keeping in, with this tradition of bridging disciplines that I now introduce our, key, our keynote, Dr. Mindy Thomas Fully Love. Dr. Fully Love is a professor of clinical psychiatry and, uh, of, and social medical sciences at Columbia University. She is a board certified psychiatrist who studies society and how we collectively make community. More specifically, she works on displacement, urban mental health, and collective consciousness. She came to this work early in her career through an examination of the AIDS epidemic and place. She went on to examine the long-term mental health consequences of environmental processes such as violence, segregation, urban renewal, and mismanaged toxins. The New York Times dubbed her a town shrink, someone who act, puts entire cities on the couch. <laughs> and among her work are two, influ two influential books, Root Shock, about how tearing up city neighborhoods hurts America and what we can do about it, and Urban Alchemy, Restoring Joy in America's Sorted Out Cities, which was Durham's citywide reading, a book study in 2015. Today, I expect she will challenge us as planners with the realities of our history while pushing us to contribute to urban restoration. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mindy Thomas Holy Love. When I first arrived, uh, the chair said, they're so enthusiastic, you could say, it's Sunday afternoon, and they will all clap. <laughs> so um, it's amazing. <laughs> I was a little shocked to be invited to do this lecture, the Siler Lecture, uh, for this 70th anniversary. I assume it's not often that you've invited a psychiatrist. Um, I'm not sure if, oh, OK. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to say that th this is, in terms of, of bridging disciplines, really the second great honor I've had this year in this regard. Um, I was named an honorary member of the American Institute of Architects a little earlier this year. And um, so this Siler Lecture is, is really, uh, in terms of thinking about cities, uh, also just a great honor. In uh, so I'm very humble in facing you and saying, I'm really going to look, share what I know as a social psychiatrist. But it's been wonderful to have this body of work recognized by people really far outside my own field. So I'd like to start by talking about people and place. And perhaps it's very important to say that in psychiatry, there are a number of subdisciplines. And I am a social psychiatrist. And so we look at people in the context of larger social systems. So people and place is very important to me. This is something that um, you may know, James Marston Fitch's American building. Um, I really like this diagram because it's certainly in psychiatry, we don't have much theorizing or much deep thinking about what is it that connects people to place. And so a lot of my work has been about, about that in that domain. And, but specifically because in psychiatry we're concerned about illness, about what are the things that make people ill related to people in place. So this diagram, which shows the the, the man inside the building, the caption is that the building is taking the load off the body, off the person, and doing work for the person. This is fundamentally important as this room is doing work for us, permitting us to sit and talk. Quite, you know, there's no outside noises. The construction next door isn't penetrating. This is very, very important. And what happens as a result of that, what I want to say, a great deal of research shows, is that we have love for places. And we are attached to them. And so from the psychiatric perspective, it's this acknowledgment of attachment and love 
that becomes the starting point of everything I want to say. So the person plus the house is a fundamental piece of communities. And in social psychiatry, because we're interested in how do we put together larger social systems, this is tremendously important to us. Just using a very simple definition of community um, that we developed while I was part of the task force on community preventive services at the Centers for Disease Control, I just want to put forward that a community is a group of people with something in common. And it could be anything. So communities always have geography, but they don't have to be co-located. So it's very important, I think, to think about that, that communities, many kinds of communities, for example, the alumni of this August department, are dispersed, yet you have in common having graduated from this program. The, related to that, communities, from the perspective of social psychiatry, have to do work. And there's some particular work that's essential if we are to have health in populations. They have to care for the vulnerable. They have to control behavior. They have to ensure well-being of the group. For example, communities have to solve problems that are put before them. So well-functioning communities are, in, from the perspective of social psychiatry, the foundation of health. In public health, we often use health as a synonym for disease. And this leads to a tremendous amount of logical confusion. But I want to use health to mean health, to mean well-being, to mean the capacity to do what you have in mind, to, to live a full and rewarding life. And the point is that communities that have a characteristic that Dr. Alexander Layton defined as being well integrated, meaning they have dense social networks that can help each other, those communities will have lower rates of disease. And interestingly and importantly, a rich person in a disintegrated community will have worse health than a poor person in an integrated community. So wealth does not pr trump community integration. Community integration is the most fundamental thing, creating health in the world as we know it. Dr. Alexander Layton proposed that we could imagine two kinds of communities and create ends of a spectrum. On the spectrum of disintegration, what he pointed out were um, that there were few and weak leaders, that the networks had become fractured. I really want to stress today that in disintegrated communities, people become preoccupied with their own well-being, with their own safety, with their own needs. Integrated communities, by contrast, have a small number of strong leaders, have large networks, have shared sentiments, meaning they feel the same way about things. And they have much lower rates of illness. One type of community is the neighborhood. And in terms of, of disease ecosystems, neighborhoods are considered a keystone of what creates human health. So what happens in neighborhoods is fundamentally important to population health. And, and here's where I get to planning. Uh, that catastrophically, there have been a long series of policies in the United States that have undermined health. So we can start with racial segregation, which gets implemented under the Jim Crow laws in the 1890s. But we have to then add on top of that redlining, and on top of that urban renewal, and on top of that highway construction, on top of that planned shrinkage and massive disinvestment, concurrently the collapse of the American industrial economy through deindustrialization, but then mass incarceration, the destruction of housing projects, gentrification, and the subprime lending crisis are a short list of policies and projects and processes that have disrupted neighborhood life in the United States. As a psychiatrist, I had no language for this, what happened to people in the course of this, and so I set out on a research project to understand the effects of this, and I wrote the book Root Shock. Um, it's about to be reissued, and this is the new cover. Um, and you'll notice that, that this, the sense of the, the photo on the cover is taken from this lithograph from Paris when Baron Hausmann was putting in the Grand Boulevards. It's, what happened in Paris is often compared to what happened in the United States. I have spent a good deal of time in Paris and studied with um, urbanists there, 
and I, it, I find the parallels actually not all that convincing, but one that is tremendously important is the sense of upheaval and distress that happened to the people. And in fact, in the, uh, at the end of this period of Baron Haussmann's upheaval in Paris, 1870, when they go to war with Germany, the Paris Commune erupts, and it erupts in the neighborhoods to which the poor people who once lived in the center had been displaced. This is, resonates with what happened in the United States. We had urban renewal for two decades, and then the cities erupted in civil disorder. So this, this, what is this doing? What are people crying out about after these periods of urban renewal? It's been the heart of my work. It seemed to me that it's always true in psychiatry that if you want to understand what somebody lost, you have to understand what they had. And so at the heart of therapy is, is you know, well, what was your relationship like? Who was this person to you? Similarly, we have to say, what was this place that was so important to you? I was very fortunate to be able to spend a good deal of time in the Hill District with the support of one of the local foundations and the Graduate School of Public Health. And um, working with the Hill, people of the Hill District and particularly Hill House, and came to know the story of that neighborhood very well. And particularly, it's, a, it's both a city and that is a neighborhood that has been richly documented in photographs, which give us a way to understand the neighborhood more objectively. People are often accused of being nostalgic for better times. Oh, the 50s weren't really better. And I think this archive of Teeny Harris's, which is now at the Carnegie Museum of Art, allows us to look and say, okay, you say you had that, but did you really have it? And there are 80,000 photographs, and I commend them to your attention, because they actually did have what they said they had. So this Iron City Marching Band is one of many organizations. And in this photograph, you can see so many different parts of the community coming together to create a marching band. And the sense of it takes a village to raise a child, it takes a whole neighborhood to raise a marching band. And they had many marching bands in this neighborhood. But somebody had to teach the drum majorettes how to dance, and somebody had to teach all those musical instruments, and somebody had to design the uniforms, and somebody had to practice marching. That, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of people. The, the ones we see on the stage aren't the only people who are involved. Not to mention, it takes an audience to go and see a parade. And there are many other photographs. Th this photograph of men playing checkers on the street, I think really helps us peer into what was the ordinary street like, like, like life, life like. <laughs> calm and orderly. There are many pictures of the streets of the Hill District and they were calm and orderly. I was on the streets of the Hill a lot doing this project and the contrasts are, were just they're mind boggling because all of this had disappeared. Um, kids that were just beautiful and happy, and busy streets. Um, an another wonderful photo of child development. Tremendous amount that was going on to, to nurture children. And, and this is what integrated healthy communities do. This is in the face of tremendous segregation, tremendous injustice. The Ku Klux Klan was riding not so much in Pittsburgh, but around Pittsburgh. So people were suffering. There's an amazing movie about black steel workers in which a guy talks about having a dream of operating this one machine in, in the factory. And he finally gets a test, but he's never been able to operate the machine before. He gets one shot at it. He's never touched a control before. So, so the racism that was going on was heartbreaking, but inside the neighborhood, there was a richness of life, a richness of organization, and all of these things that communities are supposed to do. So there were civil rights protests, and there was labor organizing, and there was incredible nurturing of the children, such that when people talk about it, they said all of the adults in the neighborhood were involved in raising all of the children. So what happens next? This is, this is an archetypal story, and so the wolf has to show up. And this is the wolf. And what do you notice about the wolf? 
And I want to say that this is like about the year after your school was founded. I think this picture was taken in 1947. So if you guys had been a little faster on the ball, maybe you could have stopped all of this. Do you think you could have a time machine and go back and start 10 years earlier? And just to, just to go back a second. So these are the men of the neighborhood. And these are the men who decide the neighborhood's fate. They're not the same people. So the destruction of the hill in this particularly haunting photograph by Teeny Harris goes on a, over a couple of years as it's being bulldozed. And it's the lower portion of the hill that's destroyed. This is the plan for the destruction. And what they decided to do was to create, they were gonna create a cultural acropolis. And the heart of it was this round building called the Civic Arena. And, but also they were gonna put in highways that would separate downtown from the black neighborhood. So this is the destruction in progress. And we don't have the time to go into this now, but this woman's face is actually identical to the woman in the Damier lithograph moving out of the center of Paris. It's an astounding thing. And so these two women's faces, separated by 80 years on different continents, capture what root shock is. And I have defined it after some hundreds of interviews as the traumatic stress reaction to the loss of all or part of one's emotional ecosystem. People say to me, well, you know, if there's cultural shift, does that cause root shock? Yeah, because culture is part of our emotional ecosystem. If there's an economic recession that puts people out of work, does that cause root shock? Yeah, it really can. So root shock is not simply in any way located to urban renewal in the United States. It's an experience that people have when they lose their neighborhood. And why? Because they are knitted into the place by all these experiences of life, by playing checkers on the street, by being in the marching band, by taking art classes, by having all the neighbors look after them. Our bodies are not separate from our neighborhoods. The neighborhoods are threaded through us. The place is holistic and we are part of it. That's why alumni come back, because this place is threaded through you, through you know late nights writing papers and going to the bar and sitting in classes, it's part of your physical being and you will carry it with you for all of your days. And when that is disrupted, when places are destroyed, we tear the body apart, we tear the very body of the person. And that is what all of these processes of disruption have refused to acknowledge. And this is the catastrophe that has fallen on our nation. This is what it looked like as it was being carried out. And I want to say that, uh, you see, it's a spaceship. And the architect actually, in the plans, drew spaceships. Um, and spaceships, if you think back to the 50s, or when this was being or planned, are very ambivalently viewed. So Carl Jung thought that people had fantasies about spaceships because they were trying to be holistic and put things together, which may have been what the architect thought. But if you watch movies, American Hollywood films, um, you know that aliens coming down from space do strange experiments on people <laughs> and that you shouldn't go near the spaceship. So there are really three almost in unsurmountable barriers between downtown and the Hill District. One is the highways, the second is the parking lots, and the third is the spaceship. So the flow between the neighborhood and downtown is ruptured. It's in a complete rupture. Now this is a noose around the neck of the neighborhood. It's the true geographic marginalization of the neighborhood. But it also strangles downtown because downtowns need nearby neighborhoods as much as nearby neighborhoods need downtown. Another view of the spaceship, in case you didn't believe me. This is an artist's rendition, Carlos Peterson's drawing, of what it was like then to watch the neighborhood cut off from resources, effectively marginalized, in the drastic deindustrialization of Pittsburgh sink in on itself. 
we are coming up on four centuries since the first Africans landed in Jamestown to be sold into bondage, 1619 to 2019. And the thing that I have encountered as a student of, of black history and as somebody who's trying to understand cities is that these tend to be told in separate pieces. Urban history is over here and black history is over here. So these stories, like the story of urban renewal, are not told in black history. Has anybody ever been to a Black History Month celebration that talked about urban renewal? No. Has anybody ever been to a planning celebration that talked about black history? Uh, so this is a first. <laughs> that makes us proud, right? OK, maybe you got late, but you're catching up. <laughs> the point I want to make here, though, is that in the first part of this story, the assaults on black people from arriving and being sold into bondage are deliberately and specifically about race. They're labeled that way. One of the great triumphs of the civil rights movement, and Martin Luther King Jr. writes about this, is that racism is seen as evil. And this happens pretty much specifically in 1963 in Birmingham when Bull Connor turns the, the police dogs and the fire hoses on men, women, and children. It's at that point that Americans say, no, this is evil, and we have to turn away from it. It's in 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama. There are more episodes of this, but they build this consciousness that racism is evil. Prior to that, if you took a social survey, you could ask people, how much do you hate black people? But there are literally these questions on surveys. You couldn't ask people, how much do you hate black people now, and get a real answer because we understand that racism is evil. But what happened was that we had not undone the structure of racism that was created in segregation, that was reified in redlining, that was then intensified by urban renewal, et cetera. And so all of these projects, all of these projects that were labeled spatial progress have in fact been racial politics and have repeatedly torn apart neighborhoods of color all across America. It's this that we have to grapple with. Because I bet nobody in this room, and I certainly include myself, has an idea how do we undo this legacy of segregation and this legacy of redlining and this legacy of repeated disruption. New York City is trying to build affordable housing. And if you read the Times yesterday, big article by Maria Navarro, that segregation is getting in the way because they don't know where to put the new buildings. Are they gonna intensify segregation? Are they gonna dilute the political power? They don't know the answer. And they're as smart planners as, as anybody that you could imagine. We don't know the answer, but we must find the answer because otherwise our spatial policies will continue to be what David Harvey calls the engine of the accumulation of, by dispossession. But the point I want to make as a psychiatrist is that this is not only robbing people of wealth. Th these are profound psychological injuries to, and profound social injuries. So we have thought of this as a downward spiral in which as you pull communities apart, you really change. You go from integration to disintegration. It doesn't happen in one fell swoop. And as you go, you change the way in which people function so that people under conditions of social disintegration use different tools, they use different languages, they carry themselves differently because that is what they have to do to survive. And this is true across marginalized communities. I was at an AIDS conference in the 80s and there was a great deal of talk about anal sex and one young man stood up and he said, I don't care what you say, I have to have anal sex because it defines me as a gay man. Now, that was not him being stupid or understanding he, wouldn't, he could get infected. That was his way of saying that he needed to defend his integrity in face of homophobia. And that, that, that this behavioral expression was a core part of how he defined and protected himself as a gay man. Violence is the same kind of thing. Wearing baggy pants is the same kind of thing. And these behaviors have to be understood as appropriate behaviors 
under conditions of social disintegration. Eva Marie Sims has published one of the most brilliant papers dealing with this. And what she said was that in the Pittsburgh's Hill District, there were three periods. In the first period, there were dense social networks, and she said people described it as having their, your own little world. Now, sociologists think about social ties in two major categories. And you could have more, you could lump or split, it doesn't matter. But I want to talk about two, the strong ties and the weak ties. So the strong ties are characterized here by the sharp 90 degree angles, and the weak ties by the wavy lines. The point is that weak ties bridge disparate groups. Strong ties, under conditions of pulling a neighborhood apart, reify. People collapse back into their groups of strong ties, and they get angry with each other. And weak ties are lost. But weak ties, paradoxically, are the ones that build society. So when we disrupt communities, we lose the way of holding the whole thing together. 1960 to 1980, so this is after urban renewal and during the period of deindustrialization, she said there was community fracture and that people began to say there was no clear path forward. Whereas all the adults had the right to discipline all the children in the whole neighborhood, now only certain adults had the right to discipline the children. And adults started to draw back from this collective function. By Sims 3, 1980 to 2004, she described dissolution and one of the people she interviewed she said, I don't know what's gonna happen when I walk out the door of my house. I look to the left, I look to the right, on expectancy. This is a terrible shift. And think of the behaviors that are now involved. As opposed to children, adults that I've interviewed who talk about walking down the street and just listening to the delicious jazz that was pouring out of all the clubs, this young man is looking to the left, looking to the right, and hoping he doesn't get shot. So far, I've been talking about the African-American community. And among my students, it's easy for them to say, and in public health, people often do, this has taken a terrible toll on the black community. And they shake their heads, and they're very sorry that we black people have been put through this. But they are convinced that nothing happened to them. But this flies in the face of logic. And so I just want to pause to, with this quotation from Dr. Martin Luther King. All I'm saying is simply this, that all life is interrelated, that somehow we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be if, until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. The apartheid system has convinced us that as long as we are separate, we are somehow impervious to each other. That racial separation is a guard all shield for those of you who are old enough to remember the old Colgate commercials. Remember the football coming at you? But it couldn't get you because of the guard all shield. Racism is not a guard all shield. And in fact, paradoxically, rates of disease in intensely segregated areas, rates of exchange, are going to be worse than when there's connection. So paradoxically, apartheid and segregation make it worse. We are not separate. So what happens to black people directly happens to white people indirectly. One of the ways of looking at this that we've played with is that we tended to think of this as a downward spiral, but obviously the spiral is happening over time. And so to play with both the fact that there's a time dimension, but also it's not a single spiral anymore, that there are fragments going off, and that the fragments are taking increasingly hostile position towards one another. And if this sounds like the 2016 election cycle, it should. This, this is where we are. This is what has happened to us as a society. My, I mentioned that one of the characteristics of disintegrated groups is that they no longer share sentiments. Their hearts beat fast for different objects. And that's what's happened to us. 
To understand this loss of shared sentiments, we have to put it in connection with the growth of hostility towards those people. I want to say every group has a those people. You can never find those people. You just go around and say, well, who, who are those people that really get on your nerves? Everybody has an answer. And the idea is the main thing you don't want to do in life is help those people. Don't help those people. So if everybody doesn't want to help those people, and everybody else is everybody's, somebody, everybody is somebody's those people. I'm somebody's those people. You're somebody's those people. All of us are somebody's those people. Don't help them. How can you run a nation? How can you respond to a disaster? How can you get out of economic crisis? How can you solve the problem of global warming? We are in a paralysis that is catastrophic for the future. So what are we supposed to do? Um, happily, there's restoration urbanism. My colleagues, the human ecologists, Roderick Wallace and Deborah Wallace, have argued that we've reached a place in the treatment of disease where we're running out of medicine, and that there, anyway, there weren't any magic bullets. When we got penicillin, we thought we'd wipe out syphilis, didn't happen. Wipe out gonorrhea, didn't happen. What happened? They became resistant to the drugs. So forget magic bullets, but they say, but there are magic strategies. And magic strategies are multi-system, multi-scale health promotion, and they fit best with the biology of people and offer the most hope for the future. These are interventions that address the large-scale social inequalities and injustices that are sensitive to local culture and that include the voices of all the people. So that's good. There's something that we can do. But how do we do this? So my research team, the city's research group, worked with people in Orange, which is my hometown, to found the University of Orange. So Orange is a basically all black and Hispanic city. It's poor. It's the butt of jokes. So when we started to say to people, we have the University of Orange, they would laugh. Because how could Orange have a university? Like associating Orange and university was an oxymoron. Um, so this is our first graduating class on the steps of our library, which, by the way, was designed by Stanford White, one of the many great sites of urbanism in the city of Orange. In fact, if you really want to know about the American city fast, come to Orange, New Jersey, because in 2.2 square miles, you can learn everything you want to know about the American city. We have a tour. <laughs> but I'm going to get that, those signs and make a magic tour, right? Yes. So my teacher in urbanism is Michel Cantal Dupar, a renowned French urbanist, and he came to Orange. And this is a photograph of him standing at the train station. The train came to Orange very, very early in the 1830s. And he's like, this is your modernity. And with that Gallic shrug, he's saying, but is this a welcome? And this is what he's looking at. So he said, you know, what's interesting is that you are like Paris, which we all said, really? <laughs> <laughs> we thought we had pretty gone pretty far at the University of Orange, but like Paris? He said, yes. You have two rivers, we have two rivers. We, we, we have one little creek. He's like, no. The railroad is like a river. And then there's a highway that went through the center of the city, and that's a river. And there's a piece of land in between. He said, and we will call that, to borrow the term from the French, Ile de la Cité. And I suggest you fix up Ile de la Cité, because then your city would function much better. A, a comment that we have taken very seriously. Um, but interestingly, none of us had been thinking about the rail line. We all understood the destruction of the highway. In fact, we've been so pleased with Secretary Fox's comments recently about highways going through poor communities, because that's definitely what happened to us. But the rail line was not something we had thought about, but he brought it to our attention and has continued to be, and is in our future, extremely important. Uh, William Marsh, who's a professor at the New School, came with his students and has helped us think about smart growth, which is a huge process in New Jersey and which focuses on developing around the rail lines. But in this, he said, look, what you have to be careful of is they're not thinking of the whole city. They're thinking of a corridor. But really, you have a whole nice little city here. And that house is because the, the shape of orange is like a house, which was also nice to learn. Like, oh, our city is shaped like a house. 
Um, and in fact, one of the first things that happened in this transit-oriented development was that the city planner of Orange, behind closed doors and without allowing any public comment, sold the land where you saw that awful parking lot to some developers to make this thing, and uh, which is now built and about to be occupied. I, but I, you know, so the point is, she was there with Kentau when he said, this is your modernity, make it something, and she immediately sold it without any public comment, without in any way ensuring that it could maximize the public good. So the, the, this is like the next level of the danger. Investment comes in, but it's only about quick profits for somebody. In New Jersey, we have a lot of pay to play, so who knows what kickbacks who got under the table for doing this deal fast and prohibiting public comment. But if somebody goes to jail, you could say, I thought maybe that might happen. Um, so, so part of this is, is, is this, we, we are in a new, a new phase of the struggle. And this rail line and this highway are at the heart of, can we in some way put the actual needs of poor black and brown people at the center of the planning and at the center of the investment? This is very difficult. The second step that we thought we had to do was to lift morale. Because mor morale is very low in these places. They're very dysfunctional, it's hard to get anything done, and you look around and it looks terrible, and everybody's telling the kids, get out the first chance you get. And everybody's like, I don't know why I got here, but I'm getting out, everybody's getting out. Which is Jane Jacobs' definition of a slum. A slum is a place you wanna leave. So at the heart of resurrecting the city is to make it a place people wanna stay, to unslum, or to use William Morris's term, we have to get people to be planning to stay. So our first effort was from a Toronto group that had developed a thing they called Murmur, which told stories in the place. It brought the storyteller to the place where the story took place to tell a story. And then there were these green ears that were installed all around, and you could call a phone number, and you'd hear this voice, Murmur, this is Murmur, what's the code? And you'd say the code, and they would tell you the story. So you would hear about here. You get it? So I wanted to play you a murmur story. Um, teenagers went out and led this project, and they came back with an, an urban cornucopia. So what's an urban cornucopia of stories? It's not the stories about the famous people that pass through town. It's the middle school dance, the Negro baseball leagues, the, visit of Martin Luther King, the oldest woman to be buried out of Woody's funeral home, a couple of church stories, the Italian bakery now makes international breads. So it's just all of these stories about life in the city. A great set of stories that, that started to help people believe, but I wanted to play you this one. My name is Deborah Allen, and we are standing in front of the Orange Memorial Hospital building on South Essex Avenue. I wasn't born here, but my children were born here. That was positive. Negative factor was when I visited the doctor here when he told us that my mother had terminal cancer. That was a very negative factor in my life. I couldn't believe it. This hospital played a big part in my life because my husband used to work here his family, his mother, his father, his sister, his brother, they all worked here at the hospital for years. This hospital has been one of the best hospitals in the area. Matter of fact, the medicine to save Liz Taylor's life was shipped from this hospital back in the 60s. She had some kind of life-threatening disease and the hospital shipped the medicine to California to save Liz Taylor's life. One, so the youth that were involved in this project, there, there are sort of two spin-offs when you do projects like this. One is the general public gets to listen to the stories, but the other is the people that, that go out, the kids that go out to collect the stories and to decide what the city is about, turned them all around. They didn't want to leave anymore, they wanted to stay. And they wanted to become decision makers and leaders of the community. And in fact, this is now um, seven years later, and they're in their 20s, they've just founded a young radical organization because they want to get involved in the politics. 
Um, the, one of them, Kamani Gibson, who's now a doctoral student at NYU in history, came back and led a group of middle school students in doing a project called Our Orange, The Discovery of Our Past. And these middle school students had the same idea, let me get out of here as fast as I can. But in walking around the city and going to Sereni's Italian Bakery and having cookies once a week, um, we, I mean, we know that's a bribe, but anyway, they're good cookies. Um, in going to parts of the city they'd never seen before, when we took them to the wealthy enclave to the south that was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted's firm, they said, are, are we still in orange? The, so we took them all around the city and showed them all these great things that they had never seen before. And they said, this changed their minds. So they want to come back. And so we are unslumming and lifting morale and giving people joy. This is not, this is not hard. It's the next piece that's hard. So naming and framing the problems you can call in experts like Michelle Cantal Dupar or Bill Morish and, and get a diagnosis. You can lift morale by telling stories. But now we actually have to launch the programs that will make it possible for poor people with minimal education to stay. We made this diagram comparing Orange, New Jersey to its next door neighbor, South Orange. And what's important is that the, the, you see the curve is shifted entirely to the left in Orange. And that the median income in Orange is 32.5 and in South Orange it's 119. Not only is it low now, but what chance do these kids have to catch up with the way things are going? And how do we break this open so that every kid has a chance? Every kid in Orange has a chance. And they don't just get displaced to someplace else. We don't just continue this awful spiral forward into time. So the University of Orange has thought of two things that we think are critical. One is we're right around the corner from Thomas Edison's factory of invention. And we are convinced that the future has to be invented. We don't know the answer to these problems. We don't know what people are going to do for jobs. We certainly don't know what to do about climate change. A lot of room for invention. But the second thing is that we believe in popular education. We believe in Septima Clark's freedom schools. We believe that education is liberation. And so it's the mashup of these two, bringing the factory of invention together with the freedom schools. That's what we think our role is and is key to, to coalitions that we're putting together. We're very, very proud to have been funded in the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health in New Jersey, first round of, of giving. And our project is, in Culture of Health, is taking a bigger picture of health, so not just targeting some disease, but really health. And we have argued that education, of all the things, is the key pathway to health. And so our project is about enhancing education. And that will lead us, as they establish a STEM high school, as we get more programs going, to having kids really doing invention and inventing the future. There are nine elements of urban restoration that I talk about in Urban Alchemy. And they derive from what I learned from leaders in the Hill District and what I learned from leaders in Orange and other places, certainly from Michel Cantal Dupar. Um, and the point is that we have three big tasks to align our thinking, to create solutions and then to connect with all the people around us. The point of this is that we need to create Sims 4, which is restoration. And what I have observed in Sims 4 is that people that are divided into these little fractured, hostile, warring groups start talking to each other. And as they begin to discover they have common ground, the conversations get more and more sensible. The conversations open up and they re-engage and they can find solutions. It's quite a remarkable process and we believe it's what needs to happen all across America. Yesterday I read um, in the New York Times that the city of Philadelphia on the occasion of the 69th day of Jackie Robinson's first day with the Dodgers issued an official apology. He was brutally attacked by the Philadelphia people and one of the things that happened, you know, there was just such vicious verbal assaults on him as he was trying to play in the game that he was really the one point in that season that he thought of he wanted to quit. He almost broke. Here he is shown with the manager of the Phillies. 
He reluctantly agreed to take this picture, which was sort of the manager's apology then, but the city thought he really deserved, even though he's no longer with us, we hope he's in heaven, and here's this more sincere apology now. But we also know that on Jackie Robinson Day, all of Major League Baseball Every player puts on the number 42. What if in every city on Jackie Robinson Day, we all put on the number 42? What if here in North Carolina, everybody put on their backs, I might not know my birth sex. What if we saw this as personal? Every single one of us. What if we saw it as every minute of every day, I make connections, I meet people, I show love, I show inclusion, I, I show inclusion, I make barriers, I stand for values, I refuse to have segregation and discrimination and injustice in my country. I open up conversations so that we can find our common sentiments, so that our hearts can be together as they once did. This used to be a country in which we shared sentiments. We went to World War II sharing sentiments about defeating fascism. We have to find those common sentiments together. And I speak to you now, not in my professional role or in your professional role, but as citizens of a country in deep, deep, deep distress. And I say that as a physician making a diagnosis. But as a person, I want to say to you, I think it's on our shoulders and in our hands. We have to do this every day. We have to wear the number 42. Thank you. Testing. Excellent. Yes. Who do explain to me that the microphone is vulnerable to being turned off? Yes. So don't put your thumb where you think you want to put it. Put it further down. Any questions? There must be a question. For my students in the audience, there must be a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if you had any insights on, we talk a lot about engagement, citizen participation, um, but in terms of communities that may be marginalized, or many are, you know, we, we need to speak a different kind of engagement maybe that we typically do in, in planning. Um, where there's a mistrust and a distance. And have you had any experience um, or offer us advice and your thoughts on that? I, I think the problem is not speaking to people. I, I think it's that planning routinely betrays people. And that you have to establish a track record of being true to your word and actually listening to people, taking what they say into the plan and not screwing them. So Rothschild Doinel Collaborative, which I had the great good fortune, they worked very closely with me and were really the architects of my book, Urban Alchemy. Um, they have a good track record. 
people flock to them for planning because they're true to their word. But the whole redevelopment of the civic arena, the civic arena has now been demolished and Pittsburgh Penguins have the rights to the land. Um, so they called in Big um, from the Netherlands. And the plan is a complete slap in the face to the community, to the Hill District, complete slap in the face. So the community has been to many meetings, but then what well, they get the plan and it's complete disrespect. So I think the issue is not going and listening. I think the issue is when you show up with your plans, what do you got to say? Um, Bill Lester again. Uh, I, I just want to thank you for this talk. This was really a moving talk. And as someone who's um, studied urban renewal, teaches about urban renewal, and is hopefully one day wanted to write more, perhaps a book length kind of thing on urban renewal, I really appreciate this because I think about economic impacts and maybe neighborhood impacts, but I, I, I rarely think about the, the social sci psychological uh, impacts. And so I'm going to run out and buy your book. But uh, my, I, my question well, you for you. you have to wait until it gets reissued. OK, I, I like the new cover. <laughs> Um, my, my question for you, and, and maybe this is uh, just my way of thinking about it, in one hand, urban renewal is such a, a, a paradox for us as planners because, um, at least the way I've, I've learned about it, it was a time when planners were given uh, the most sort of uh, authority and uh, uh, independence as a profession, and society trusted planners in a way uh, that I think hasn't existed since. And for good reason. I think uh, as a profession, we, to use the baseball analogy, we got up to the big leagues and uh, struck out uh, pretty badly. And the frustrating part about it is that there's now uh, so much need in urban, urban areas. And there's some of us or some people around this room would love to, to have a, you know, a new federal program to you know, triple the HUD budget and really invest in cities and do all this work that could be done. But there's this sort of burning memory of urban renewal and having planners be at that level of, uh, uh, of import again. And it seems like a tension. So my question to you is, if, if you could, would you recommend some kind of major new federal level investment in cities? And what would it look like with the memory and the legacy of urban renewal uh, in our past? What would it look like? You know, we're staring gentrification, we're staring transit-oriented development in the face, and, and are these better? They're not. So would I recommend more big money to go in? To, it's going into the same machine. Urban Renewal created a machine of politicians and developers, and that machine is still in existence today. And that machine is always touting spatial progress, but it's always racial upheaval. So until we have that conversation, no, I wouldn't, because it would be more of the same. And the more money, the more destruction. We have to have a fairly brutal conversation about the fact that spatial policies are the new racism. But however, I do want to say, I don't want to leave you in despair. No, no. <laughs> this is more from a psychiatric perspective. <laughs> My colleague, Jack Saul, wrote a book called Collective Trauma, Collective Recovery. And we are coming up on the anniversary of Jamestown. So 2019 is an anniversary. You are planners. So I think you should all read Jack Saul's book, Collective Trauma, Collective Recovery, and plan an anniversary celebration in which we get to discuss some of these things. And we talk about how do, how do spatial policies in a, in, a, in a segregated nation, how do spatial policies get disentangled. If we could figure that out, we could move forward. An anniversary is a, a wonderful time to say, look, we gotta pause for a minute and have a conversation, because it's been 400 years, we keep doing the same mistakes, what's the new path we wanna take? So perhaps that's a, that, that is what I do recommend. Can I ask a question here? I did read the same article in the Times yesterday about the dilemma the city of New York faces in affordable housing in the face of de facto segregation. What immediately sprung to mind was Brooklyn, where I've done a lot of retail field work over the years, which is essentially a collection of very vibrant ethnic communities of various types from around the world, most of which that seem to have all the positive attributes you outlined at the very beginning in terms of cultural support, institutions, family connections, and everything else. How, but they're geographically concentrated. 
How do you reconcile that with integration, which by definition means some geographic dis redistribution of somebody in the preservation of those community ties and the essential function of community? I personally am opposed to segregation, but I am not for integration. Uh, I think anybody should, we should have free open housing, which we do not have. So everybody will kind of scatter themselves around. There will still be ethnic enclaves, but there will be scattering. Um, were we to have open housing, but we don't. I don't, I think there has been way too much upheaval and displacement. So anyway, well, we've got to achieve integration. First of all, that's always a lie because anybody who sets out to achieve integration just moves the black people. And in fact, I have come to believe that whatever the problem is with the American city, the answer is move the black people. So don't move the black people. <laughs> whatever the problem is, don't move the black people. Don't move anybody. So then the issue of they have this plan to put up these tall buildings that will have some affordable housing. I, I think this is a terrible plan because what's it going to do? It's going to accelerate the gentrification. So what we don't have and where the planners come in is a comprehensive plan for how you attack gentrification and how do you get housing for the whole demographic, as Ken Doyle likes to say. You know, the market doesn't house the lower half of the demographic. So who's going to house them? Because everybody, everybody's so hostile to those people. Well, we, we don't want to house those people. They should pull themselves up their, by their bootstraps like I did. So there's got to be a comprehensive plan that says we need this many low-income housing units for this bracket. We need this many for here. We need, and it's got to be for every city. But it's got to be a formula that you could work out from the census data. And do you have enough? What's the price range? And then you figure it out from there. And then we fight nationally, all of us together, for those things to get implemented. The, um, but until we have that, I think these piecemeal things are, 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 are going to make the problem worse. In public health, we have discovered that when we focus on intermediary things, we make problems worse. We tell people to stop smoking, it increases health disparities. Another paradox. I think the same is true in housing. If we don't look at this, what's the fundamental problem? We don't house everybody. We say the market can do it because the housers, the developers have big lobbies. The market can't do it. So we have to lay, you should be laying that out for people over and over again. The market can't house everybody, and, but everybody needs a house. So I, I don't, I, I, it's, the goal is not integration. The goal is desegregation, open housing, and a house for everybody. That's how I see it. I, f I feel like I'm at a Baptist revival. I, I can't thank you enough for your, your comments today. I, I'm just in love with you. And, and I'm very tearful. Most of the people in this room, as you can see, are products of white privilege. And help us find a way to turn white privilege into a positive force in this country. Well, I don't believe in white privilege. I know it's a very popular concept, but I don't believe in it. I, I believe that um, Spike Lee said the other night at the Bernie Sanders rally in, in Washington Square Park, are you tired of the okie doke? <laughs> white privilege is the okie doke. White privilege is, is, is the moonshine you've been sold so that you don't ally with us black people. That's all it is. Are you living in a great nation because you're white? You're living in the same messed up nation I'm living in. You all don't have any privilege. What you have is delusions. That's what we call them in psychiatry. It's a delusion. So don't fall for the okie doke. That's my advice. You have no privilege more than me. And it's very injurious to your soul to think you're better than somebody else. This is not godly. You want to invite God into just to be Baptist? For, I'm not Baptist. I'm <laughs> Unitarian Universalist, which is very far from Baptist. But, but to just borrow some of that language, we want to invite God, however you think of God or the universe or being in touch with the spirit, you want to invite that into your soul. You can't exclude any big portion of the world. You've got to bring in everybody because God brings everybody with him, right? Jesus went to the lepers. He went to the prostitutes. That's where we've got to go. So... It hurts your soul to think to, to act as if you have privilege. It hurts your soul. You don't want to do that. So who's closer to God at this point? 
the black people are closer to God. My grandson explained the other day to us who God was. He said, he's, he's a black guy, and he, you know that God is a black guy. And he was married, and he had children, and he went through his trials. And then he was immortalized, and he became God. And this was about a thousand years ago. <laughs> Just in case you were wondering who God was. <laughs> um, so the... I just don't think there's such a thing as white privilege. I think there's a white delusion that there's privilege. But don't buy it. And how do you know that you're not buying it? Because there's an easy test. And the test is, start looking everybody in the eye and try to figure out what do you have in common with them. I'm an addiction psychiatrist in 12-step fellowship. They talk about identify, don't compare. Every single person you see on the street say, what do I have in common with them? Identify. Practice identifying, don't compare. Because privilege is about comparing. It's fake. It's not going to get you closer to God or godliness or a sane society that can manage climate change. Whether you're pragmatic and you just don't want to drown, or you're religious and you want to get to heaven, same outcome. Identify, don't compare. That's your task. Does that make sense? Good. <laughs> it's, an easy, it's an easy task. As a student, okay, there you go, sorry. Um, as a student, I, I graduated from a primarily white institution, an undergrad, UNC Asheville, and then coming here, a much larger primarily white institution, and I guess I, I wanted to know your perspective um, on what planning students should do to prepare to communicate with people who are experiencing root shock. What steps can they take in their educational process to kind of deal with that? Because we're not necessarily in an environment that um, screams diversity and cultural competency every day. However, you know, whether the department is super diverse or not, which I believe it is, and it has, you know, a wide variety of projects, but um, how do you recommend that we work on that despite our, our, our environment at large? Um, I, there are two things. One is get a bunch of students and take a field trip to the National Archives in College Park and study the redlining documents. Redlining documents are not yet freely available, and the people who have spent a lot more time with them than I have say that they are the real version of American fascism. They were developed in 1937, so two years after Hitler imposed the Nuremberg Code, and the language is literally and explicitly racist. It's shocking, it's horrifying, do not go by yourself. Take a big group of people and go out to a bar afterwards because you're gonna need it. That's essential because how are you gonna plan to undo racism if you don't know this crucial point in the imposition of racism and these and linking it to the banking system. You gotta know this stuff cold, so go there. Or get them to put all the documents online, but I think feeling them, seeing the handwritten notes, infiltration of Jewish, encroachment of Negro, you gotta read this stuff, you gotta feel sick to your stomach. So you just like, no, we can't have this anymore. So take a field trip. The second thing is that we, we say three things in any neighborhood. Walk the neighborhood, tell stories, and find the elephants. Elephants is a concept that Michel Cantal Dupart developed as part of a project he was doing in um, 1989 called Benue Quatre-Vingt-Neuf, and it was the special places. And the point is, every place has special places. So go with people, walk neighborhoods, tell stories, and find the elephants. Cantal told me when I was starting to study cities that I should go to see one city a week. See a lot of cities and walk with a lot of people. You'll be a good planner. But go to the archives. Become sick. It's like inoculation, right? If you're inoculated against racism, you won't do it. Ms. Fuller Love, thank you very much for your inspiring, warm, uplifting, very praiseworthy remarks. Uh, I can very much relate to the Baptist revival sentiment. Uh, and uh, learned about that stuff from my wife. But uh, the, 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 blood coming. The, huge, the huge question begged, of course, is one that you've been partially addressing in answers to previous questions, which is the logistical, strategical, uh, tactical question of how we get from here to there. 
which begs all qu kinds of questions about the kinds of questions that Saul Alinsky thought about in community organizing addresses, political uh, questions. Uh, the, your message is one of peace and love, and I would love to see uh, a situation where every American was compelled to listen to that talk of yours, live and in person, either in church or out of church. But uh, it also makes me wonder about the, the, the people who speak in terms of, uh, you know, the famous uh, Fre Frederick Douglass quote about power never yielding anything without a struggle, and uh, Malcolm X talking about you're either with us or against us, you're either part of the problem or part of the solution. Where in this crisis do you see the role, if anywhere, for more confrontational struggle? I'll just leave it at that. Um, well, I am uh, a follower of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s School of Nonviolent Action, and I believe that confrontations, nonviolent confrontations, are an important part of the struggle. But in my book, Ruchak, because it's part of the exploration of what did we have, what did we lose? So therefore, what did we have? One of the stories that I found quite emblematic of what African-American communities had before urban renewal, and I highly recommend all the books on this subject to you before you go into the field, is the story of the Montgomery bus boycott. As we all know, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a Montgomery bus on December 1st, 1955. This was a Thursday. The Montgomery bus boycott started on December 5th, 1955, and 50,000 black people boycotted the buses. Now, do you know any organizer anywhere in the United States that could get 50,000 people to do anything in five days? Uh, this is fracture. This is what was destroyed. Montgomery rose up as one. That's common sentiments, that's shared sentiments. They said, no, we will not take this anymore. They had had decades of abuse on the bus. The bus was the front line of segregationism. So they were beaten on the buses, they were dragged by the buses, they were robbed by the buses, they were denigrated by the buses. So they hated the buses. And when they mistreated Rosa Parks, who was a beloved community leader, they rose up and said, no. 50,000 people. We cannot do that today because we have been through decades of urban renewal, highway construction, deindustrialization, planned shrinkage, mass incarceration, un mismanaged epidemics, gentrification, the foreclosure crisis. Our communities are fractured. Therefore, why do we have to start with a line? Because we have to get the pieces to start talking to each other. We have to assemble, we have to reassemble. This is restoration urbanism. Until we restore it, we haven't got enough people on the same page to stand up and roar enough. We have to get there first. But when we get there, trust me, there will be some demonstrations. Because that's a natural part of people. They stand up and roar when they can. Professor Alexander Layton, who is the father of social psychiatry, had the good fortune to do a study and a lot of his work comes out of ex examining what the experience of Japanese Americans in the concentration camp at Poston, Arizona. And after they got organized, they had a confrontation with management. So confrontations, nonviolent protests are a part of the political struggle, and they will be a part of the struggles. But when you have fragmentation, the first thing you have to do is heal the fragmentation. That's where we are, we have to heal the fragmentation. That's why I was so grateful to Spirit House for, and thank you Spirit House, for doing this remarkable thing of leading a citywide reading of urban alchemy. We personally want to take that model to every city that we can. We're going to Niagara Falls in, in three weeks, and we hope to go to many, many, many more cities because this first piece, align. Let's align. It's hard work to align, but let's get that done. And then I think other things will follow. That's my, that's my analysis. Um, we can There are a lot of people doing mass organizing in Flint. Just what you keep your eye on Flint. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, you keep your eye on Flint. Up, up there? Is this on? Yeah. Oh, there it goes. Um, my question was just your thoughts on last summer's um, Supreme Court decision about disparate impact and the fair housing laws and the recent recommendations from HUD about saying that blanket bans on uh, criminal records is not a best practice in terms of leading to a disparate impact claim. If you thought, saw any hope in that or uh, just your thoughts on where, if anywhere, that might go to break up that spatial um, racism that you were talking about? Um, I wouldn't say, I, I would say that's above my pay grade as a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> you got to call in somebody else. Uh, wait, where are you, Danielle? Yes. Uh, ask Danielle. She'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, we can have a conversation in my. <laughs> um, oh. Uh, thank you. Um, I've lived and been in a lot of neighborhoods in my life where the situation is two neighborhoods are immediately adjacent. One is more affluent, more educated, usually more white, but not exclusively. The other is poorer, uh, less educated, and more non-white. And it can be Hispanic, they're different. What often happens is the more affluent community feels a little bit besieged by crime. There are holdups, there are, and they call for more police protection, and then the police get more involved, and the police become uh, more aggressive in the lower income, and then you kind of see the results of all that. This is really common. What is a psychiatrist who cares about spatial structure? What can you do about this? Well. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, I actually make the joke at the end of my book, Urban Alchemy, <clears throat> take nine elements of urban restoration and call me in the morning. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I think you can speak to that from Spirit House, that, that these, um, you have to get people talking to each other. It was remarkable to read emails from people who had been involved with this citywide book reading and who had gone out on walks because part of it was go see the city. Uh, although I know that people could sit in their houses and read Urban Alchemy, but you really got to go see the city. You have to see exactly that. You've got to see the ways in which we are currently sorted by race and class. And you have to look at each other's neighborhoods and start to see the elephants. And I, one of the emails, one of the people wrote that she had found elephants, and now she wanted to see all the elephants in Durham. That's a breakthrough, because then people aren't talking about we need more policing. They're talking about, oh, we have a lot of great things in our city, and how do we use them to get everybody on the same page? How do we unsort our city? So it's putting this challenge, it's reframing the problem. In, in psychiatry, we believe that reframing is fundamentally important, and the reframe here is that, is that the, 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 the wrong idea the cognitive truth that's held, that's taught us by racism, is that the more separate we are, the safer we are. But the reality is, the more separate we are, the less safe we are. And so the issue is to, to make that cognitive shift. And the first element of urban restoration is that you have to keep the whole city in mind. What's the brilliant thing about cognitive therapy um, and the people who invented it is that you can shift the cognition actually fairly easily and then it opens up the behavior. And this is why cognitive therapy has become really the number one treatment for depression and anxiety and phobia and a whole host of things. So I'm recommending cognitive therapy for all of America. And <laughs> the main thing is to teach people that racism doesn't keep us safe and keeping the whole city in mind can. Is it working? Okay. Um, Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. Um, I want to ask about um, immigrants in the U.S. and um, like maybe about their um, social psychiatry. If you have like come across that in your work and uh, the implications for for planning. Um, let me frame the the question like this. Um, I'm from Colombia in South America. Um, I came here as an international student. Uh, but for many people, um, you know, immigrants are forced to get out of their countries and they come here and they don't only...
<laughs> I bet you touched the off. Okay, it's working out. Yeah. So they 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 don't only lose their communities, but they also. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's working now. So they, they don't only lose their communities, but they also come here. <laughs> but I'm not pushing. But don't come near it. Okay, so um, so they. Just loud. Well, the question was, what is my opinion about immigrants who come here, who lose their communities and aren't allowed to integrate into the United States? Okay. So, um, having said that social integration is the foundation of all health for all people, and that whatever affects some directly affects all indirectly, you can you know that I would reason that this way of treating newcomers to our country is both evil from a moral perspective and dangerous to the health of all from a pragmatic perspective. So I'm totally against it. I think that um, we have done some, some work on this issue. And when immigrants are, are well received, Russian Jews coming to New York City come into a big Russian Jewish community that makes the entry very easy. It just really changes the pace and the experience. So all immigrants should be well received. And we are a nation of immigrants. Why not have some more? Um, we have a few empty cities in the middle of the country. <laughs> They're pretty much going to fill up soon because of rising sea levels. But if the immigrants get there first, then they can welcome us <laughs> from the coast. <laughs> so that's what I think. I think we're come to the end of our time together. That's what we say in psychiatry. Yes. <laughs>